Hello and welcome to our evening tonight and to the University of Southern Maine. My name is Glenn Cummings. I am the president here at the University of Southern Maine. It is a warm opportunity for us to bring people together today. Uh, we have a number of special guests uh, that uh, we would like to acknowledge. First of all, we have a number of members of our state legislature. Uh, if you would stand up, please. Uh, Representatives Austin, Representative Babbage, Representative Brennan, Representative Farnsworth, Representative uh, uh, Galgay Reckett, uh, uh, Representative Hymanson, Representative Jorgensen, Representative Ordway, Representative Perry, and Representative Terry, and also Senator Farron and President of the Maine State Senate, Troy Jackson. We please all stand. Thank you for coming today. Also, members of the USM President's Circle, distinguished alumni, faculty, staff, students, and friends are here with us. Thank you all for being out to support us. The Foundation Board and the staff members who have done an amazing job of organizing tonight's event, please join me in thanking them. Corey Haskell and her team and Ainsley Wallace have been fabulous. Ever. A special shout out tonight to the Collins and Sear family. Uh, Mickey Collins' wife, uh, Lynn Collins, also from the class of 91. She and Mickey are what we call Husky Honeys, and uh, they've met here on this campus and have been together ever since. Uh, Lynn is with us, and, uh, and Peyton and Riley, their, their two daughters, who have embarrassed me numbers of times on the basketball court, uh, they are with them as well. Uh, Lynn Collins's mom and dad, Jerry and, uh, excuse me, Jerry and Roger Sear, uh, and Mickey's mom and dad, Ned and Mar uh, Mary Martha Collins. Please join me in welcoming the family of the Collins. We will note that we had a man called McDreamy here just a few minutes ago. He's also, but uh, he had uh, been up uh, early this morning and has, uh, has disappeared. But we did have with us Patrick Dempsey. This is a good chance for us Mainers to say thank you for all the work he's done in supporting Mainers with cancer. This has been tremendous. We have some uh, sponsors of tonight's event that we need to acknowledge. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Dale drove num the car number eight, which was a Chevy, and to their credit, Pape Chevrolet. Uh, please raise your hand. Thank you if you're from Pape Chevrolet. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all you've done. They said I'd get a half-price bolt after this, which I appreciate. So. Uh, Martin's Point Healthcare, our Steve Armando is here, and I just want to thank you. They've been longtime supporters of USM and the first to sign on as a sponsor of the event. Thank you, Martin's Point Healthcare. <laughs> One of our graduates, Dr. Fred uh, Fridman, and Dr. Fridman has brought in his organization, New England Rehabilitation Hospital of Portland. Thank you for being here and supporting that. And Brian Cochran is here from Shamrock Sports and Entertainment. Welcome and thanks to this great sports marketing firm with a passion for NASCAR. Brian, thank you for your sponsorship. <laughs> we also have with us uh, a special guest, the founder of IDEX and the uh, re uh, recent past president of the board of directors for Covetris, David Shaw is with us. So David, thank you. Our media partner is the Portland Press Herald, the Maine Sunday Telegram. They have already been in talking to Mickey and Dale, and we're very pleased. Thank you for your support. And now for, thank you. Now to, for me to introduce uh, the moderator of tonight's event, a name that many of us here in Maine are very familiar with, Diane Atwood. She has had a long and distinguished career focusing on health and wellness, including 20 years as a respected Maine health reporter for News Center 6. And today, Diane writes an award-winning blog called Catching Health and hosting the podcast series Conversations About Aging. Diane is also a former USM student who took classes in our art program, and we'd love to have you come back and finish that degree, Diane. Uh, and uh, we want you to please welcome Diane Atwood, our moderator for the evening.
Diane is apparently doing artwork somewhere in the <laughs> university. <Yeah. laughs> Peyton, do you mind coming up and do a little moderation? Does that, does that work for you? Uh, Yay! And now I'm honored and proud to introduce tonight's two distinguished guest speakers, a very, uh, very honorable, successful alumni, Dr. Mickey Edwards, class of 91, and honorary doctorate, class of 19, uh, just recently. Dr. Collins is an internationally renowned concussion expert who has worked with a number of famous patients, one of whom has joined him tonight. A pioneer and, and global leader in the field of sports-related concussions, Mickey is the co-founder and director of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center's Sports Medicine Concussion Program. We have several people, Craig Smith and others, from that program here tonight. He is also a professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. A graduate of USM's class of 91, he received an honorary degree this past May. And I should also add that Dr. Collins is a member of USM's World Series Championship Baseball Team, 1991. <laughs> Welcome back to one outstanding USM Husky, Dr. Mickey Collins. And Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And finally, a man who needs little introduction, a team owner, an author, and racing analyst for NBC Sports, Dale Earnhardt Jr. He is a NASCAR superstar and a member of the legendary Earnhardt racing family. Dale grew up in North Carolina and worked at his dad's car dealership where he serviced cars, changing the oil and doing maintenance work when he was as little as 11 years old. He started racing at the age of 17. But over his epic 25-year racing career, he suffered multiple damaging concussions, which led him to seek medical treatment. Dale's return to health under the care of Dr. Mickey Collins is recounted in his 2018 best-selling memoir, Racing to the Finish, My Story. He will be signing copies of that after our discussion tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dale Earnhardt, Jr. decided that I am amongst a huge room full of superstars. Because I know there's one or two of you who are here to see this superstar. But I am guessing that many of you are here because you have dealt with concussions firsthand. Either you've had a concussion, either you've taken care of somebody, your provider, your family member. I am in awe of each and every one of you. So superstars, welcome. And now I'm up on stage with these two superstars. <laughs> Dale, you started, as we just heard, racing at 17. 25 years. How many concussions that you know of do you think that you had in that time? Well, when I, you know, when I realized how serious concussions were, in 2012, when I went to see Mickey, um, I certainly started thinking back in my career and wondering, man, you know, how many of these have I had that I didn't know about? And I started remembering uh, races and wrecks and crashes where we would, uh, there was one particular, for example, at uh, Daytona in 1998. And we, uh, I went flipping down the back straightaway, and uh, got out of the car and felt didn't no, didn't notice anything right away. And I went to do an interview about ten minutes after the crash, and I got real dizzy, and just about lost my balance. Like I, I thought maybe I was passing out or getting lightheaded, uh, and I laughed inside about it. And I bragged to some friends about it. And I went home and was working on a race car in the shop that week. 
and I was laying on my back inside the car, working underneath the dash, and our race cars are on casters in the shop, so they're easy to maneuver uh, around on the floor. So the car's raised up off the ground on these casters, and I jumped up immediately because it felt like somebody had rolled that car all the way across the shop floor, and I thought maybe I didn't hear the casters rolling, but I thought somebody was playing a joke on me, but the car hadn't moved. And so the motion of me roll, you know, laying back and moving my head uh, to lay down created this sort of uh, uh, effect or this issue, and I laughed about it. And I told my crew chief or some of the guys in the shop in that moment about it. But that was the culture back then. I went to tell the people that I thought might be impressed. Like, hey, I bump, you know, I'm dizzy from that crash. How about that? <laughs> or, uh, you know, and, and it was my team, and I wanted them to think, you know, man, you're tough. Or I, it, was, it was macho and bravado and all that. And so that was one instance, and I started thinking of others in my career before I realized that concussions were serious business to be taken, you know, taken care of. And I would have never in the first half of my career thought to seek medical help for a concussion or, an, or a head injury. The idea before we knew about the care that Mickey Collins provides, the idea for me for that decade and a half was to rest and it would go away. If you hit your head, it wasn't nothing long term. It was just, you know, it might be dizzy and, and foggy and double vision or whatever the symptoms might be, but it'd be temporary. Uh, but it was nothing to worry about and it would go away and you're fine. As soon as you felt fine, you were fine. And we know now that that's not the case at all. And uh, so it's hard to quantify just how many there have been. I know uh, the only reason why I know how many that I had from 2000 and 2000, from 2012 to 2016, the second time I went to see Mickey, was because I documented them in my phone in the Notes app. And, yeah, if you've read the book, you know, you understand what was going on there. But basically, uh, when, I, when I got my first uh, visit to Mickey, uh, I was pulled out of the race car, wasn't going to race for a couple weeks. I went through his rehabilitation, the physical and, and, and mental and uh, rehabilitation and treatment and all that. Anyways, I'm, two weeks I was out of the car and I got back in the car and that was a very educational experience and Mickey was extremely uh, great at, at spelling out everything that was going on and why I felt cert, uh, certain things and it was just really, I, I really downloaded so much information and I felt so empowered. And so the next time I crashed, I thought to myself, uh, I know how to handle this, and I know what to do. And, and, but the one thing I wanted, to, the one thing I started doing that was new was documenting how I felt. So when I crashed, I would write down that moment, what I felt, if I felt any symptoms whatsoever. And I would do that the next morning, the next day at lunch, the next night before I went to sleep. And I did it three times a day until I felt 100% in my mind, you know. What yeah. about that back in 2012 yeah. when you were just kind of like saying, hey, look at me, I've got a ding here on my head and aren't I wonderful? Something, though, caused you to cross that line and you became afraid. And yeah. so what brought you to Mickey that first time? I crashed at a test at Kansas in 2012. Where I was, where a test is where you're out there kind of by yourself. It's not a race weekend. Uh, no, no fans at the track. It's a very sort of lonely experience, to be honest with you. But you and your team are out there testing. And I uh, was at a newly repaved racetrack, and we were running over 190 miles an hour. And the right front tire blew, and I hit the wall. And it was a violent, violent, scary, hard, singular event. Very, very loud, hard impact. I, I never felt anything like that before. I never have experienced anything like that since, and I don't think I ever will. So it was just a really unique set of circumstances to put me in such a violent collision. And so the G-forces were over 50 G-forces to my body, and 
Um, I was never knocked out. I've never been knocked out in a crash, if you can believe that. I'm, I, would, I would gladly tell Mickey if I had. What were the symptoms that you had after this um, one? So I got done crashing and got out of the car, and I felt dazed. I just felt dazed. I felt stunned. Have you ever uh, shaken a pinball machine and, and, and it sort of quits working for a few seconds? Tilts. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I felt like. I felt like that pinball machine that was, that was tilted. And a buddy, one of the guys on the crew is looking at me in the, in the garage and he goes, you ain't right. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you're staring right through me. You just look glassed over. And I'm like, oh, you could tell. <laughs> and I was, you know, I, was, I went, we went and ate at this restaurant a few minutes later and I got sick. Before, you know, before we sat down to order, I'm starting getting really nauseous. And then I, that's when I got very scared. Uh, I was extremely nauseous. And out of nowhere, just out of nowhere, just felt this terrible, terrible feeling in my body. You know, when you get sick on your stomach, this was, the whole body was nauseous. It was a weird, awful experience, and I wanted to leave the room immediately. And it was busy full of people, and nobody in there knew what was going on with me. And I'm looking around thinking, uh, can, can other people tell what's happening? It was very, very scary. But that, I just knew that this was something to take really serious. And uh, I was very scared, but I didn't reach out to Mickey. I didn't reach out to a doctor. I raced the next weekend. I actually went to a Washington Redskins game that night. And I was on national TV in the, in the booth during halftime uh, with a serious hair injury. And I look back on that now and just think how foolish and silly that was. But it was the problem with me and, and maybe a lot of people that have that injury is life is a, your life is a, a train that's rolling down the tracks and it affects other people. And you can't just stop everything you're doing in that moment and, and take care of you because it affects your wife or your kids or, or, or your job. There's so many people depending on you, and for you to just stop and sit down and say, I need to do something about this for me is hard. I had friends that had been looking forward to going to that game for, for months. Uh, my wife was there to go, and, and I thought, what do I do? What do I do? How do I shut this off? How do I tell them that I'm, I feel bad and I don't want to go? So I went, and then I made it through the next week and went and raced about four weeks in a row. And I didn't feel good till, till the fourth week. I finally woke up one day after about four weeks and felt great. And it was like Christmas morning. I was like, yes, finally I'm over this mess. It was awful. I'm behind, it's behind me. I'm, I'm good. And I crashed in that race. And I felt all the stuff come right back. All the things that I'd felt four, month, four weeks ago all rushed back and were there immediately, except for there was some new stuff. There was anxiety and there was anger. And there was, I was extremely angry that this had happened to me. Like I couldn't, I, I'm not an angry person. I don't fight. I don't, I hate confrontation. I, 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 I compromise and I'm ready to give up everything I can to keep things nice and cohesive around me. And, um, but I was angry in this, in this. And I did an interview after <laughs> that crash that I look at and watch now and laugh because of who, I don't even recognize that person. But when we were driving out of the racetrack, I said to my wife, I said, I'm, I'm hurting and I feel very bad. I feel I'm describing these symptoms to her of being sort of trapped and, and disconnected from reality and disconnected from conversations and confused and foggy and, and scared and mad. And I just, and she's, we're talking about it. And I told her, I said, I think, you know, considering what happened four weeks ago and how nasty that was and this, I feel like, you know, I need to go see a doctor. I gotta, I'm layering concussions I'm, I'm putting concussions in too close proximity together, and this is something I need to get some answers on, and I'm scared. And uh, so I went to a doctor in Charlotte called Dr. Jerry Petty, and he's sort of the NASCAR doctor, and I've seen him for all kinds of injuries. And he's the guy that said, I know a man in Pittsburgh, and he can fix you. <laughs> and he, he gave me, he called Mickey and said, Mickey, I got somebody I want to send up there to see you. 
and the, that's when I met Mickey. So what did you see when you first met Dale? What did you notice? And how, what, what are the kinds of tests that you did, and how did you make a diagnosis? The first thing about Dale is he came with an entourage of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I suddenly realized that, in all seriousness, there is, you have to understand the person you're treating and, and the pressures they're under. And, and Dale is a, is a brand. I mean, let's be honest about this. He's, he, there's so many people that he affects in so many ways. And I could see that very well. I mean, I think Mike Davis was there. I think uh, Amy was there. Uh, I think your sister was there. I think Dr. Petty came with you. And they all sat in the room, remember? And we sat there and, um, you know, trying to go through this with Dale. And knowing that he wanted to get back in the race car immediately, but... He also, as you can tell, is a very insightful, thoughtful guy who wanted information. And he was worried about it. And, um, and I could tell Dale's very ruminative. There's a lot that goes on under, underneath with him. There's a lot of thinking that goes on, a lot of thoughts. He's a very active-minded guy. And he internalizes a lot of that stuff. So I kind of recognize that in Dale. And that plays a role in recovery, by the way. Um, and so understanding his personality. but. What we do is we now have identified there's different types of concussions, Diane. We've actually identified six different types of concussions, and what I was trying to do is to figure out where, what is this happening, what is happening with him. And everything you're talking about, Dale, about sitting under the car and the car feeling like it's moving, the restaurant being in a busy environment, the nausea, the dizziness. You know, when you start hearing those things, you know there's a system in the brain called the vestibular system that's affected. And that system is responsible for so much. How many of you have a history of car sickness in this room? Well, if you got hit in the head, you would go down the vestibular pathway, and that feeling you have in the car is the system that gets decompensated from the injury, and it's a very unpleasant feeling. It's nausea, foggy, dizzy, environmental sensitivity. But what's interesting is the vestibular system is actually connected to the sympathetic nervous system in the brain. And so not only do you get the crud of the vestibular problem, but you also get very anxious. And in a ruminative guy, the thoughts go even faster, and the internalization gets stronger, and you get caught in this really bad, vicious cycle with it. And so when I saw Dale, and I knew that was the type of concussion he had, I knew we had to get him active, because the way we treat a vestibular problem is by retraining it, it's not by rest. And so I had to tell Dale, I want you in that restaurant. I want him feeling those symptoms. I actually want him exercising. We, provi we prescribed a very rigorous, workout program for Dale. We have him retrain the vestibular system through certain head movements and eye movements. And, and you also had a problem with your left eye in that first evaluation. He had an exophoria where his left eye wasn't working as well with his right. And we Is that were, a different type then? Is yeah, it's an ocular type. But, so I'd say his first concussion was primary vestibular, secondary ocular. And so we prescribe whatever treatments that match those problems. And Dale did those treatments. And quite honestly, you got back in a race car two weeks. Three. And I never heard from him again. For five years. <laughs> uh, but I want to add that I, told, I made it very explicit to Dale when he left. I said, Dale, if you have these symptoms again, I want to know about it. And, and We're going to talk about yeah. that in a second. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be on the mm -hmm. hot seat. Yeah. Uh, can you explain for all of us, though, these other six types? So the six different types are cognitive or thinking changes, the vestibular system, um, the third is ocular motor, so your eyes need to work together as a team, and sometimes we can see problems with that. The fourth type is migraine, which is what it sounds like. Neck issues is number five, and the sixth subtype is anxiety and mood issues. So do you treat <clears throat> each one of them with particular types of exercises, or is there a separate treatment program? So we have about 40 or 50 permutations in each of those circles as well. So. A vestibular problem can present in a myriad of different ways, you know, all kinds of different ways. So we have treatments for those different problems. But yeah, we have totally different treatments for those different types of concussions, and, and you, have to, you have to figure out what's going on, use the right tools to assess it, ask the right questions, do the right physical exam, understand the personality and the, the person itself. And, you know, concussion fights dirty. Like, whatever you bring to the table that's weak, it gets outed. So the car sickness leads you down a vestibular pathway. If you have a your lazy eye, you're ocular. Migraine, migraine. Anxiety, anxiety. And so it's actually not how, not how hard you get hit in the head, but what you bring to the table when you get hit in the head 
as to if you get a concussion and what type of concussion you have. But then you match the right treatment to the right problem, and this is a treatable condition. It just needs to be done very carefully. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who didn't have access to a program like yours mm -hmm. who maybe didn't receive those kinds of treatments. And so maybe now, years later, they still have some issues going on. Could you treat somebody like that? Absolutely. In fact, there's a lot of people sitting in this audience right now that went through that, that I've treated as well, that have gone through it for years, hmm. um, that we get better. And I'm very confident that this is a treatable problem. Um, I'm very confident in our therapies, in our rehab approaches, and our knowledge. We've advanced our knowledge tremendously. And this is a, a very manageable condition. But, you know, you get in trouble a little bit, and Dale got in trouble when you layer these things and you don't manage it effectively. And, but the thing is, and joking aside, Dale, I, I completely understand why you did what you did in terms of those notes and why you approached it that way. Instead you of telling anybody. You didn't want to get out of the race car, and I, I get that. And, and also, it's just, you're, you're, you said it very well, you're rolling down the track, yeah. you know? They're just, in, in that moment um, in 2016 when I got, you know, when I was starting to realize that I had a real serious issue that I wasn't going to be able to manage this myself, through that, thir I saw how hard 2012 and just missing two races was on all the things that were connected to me partnerships and sponsors, my team, my, you know, um, not only on my cup race team, but we have our Xfinity team and junior motorsports and, and just my, there was just so many things that depended on me going to the track and being in the car every week. And I thought, you know, man, I can just, maybe if I can just avoid crashes, I, you know, I'm starting, I had some, <laughs> I had some crashes. Yeah, if I maybe just don't crash for a while. Um, and you didn't. You didn't. Yeah. I mean, for you a just, while. You you justify and you 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 rationale and you 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 know you figure you think that you you know I've went through this and he gave me the tools to get well and I have a, I had a big role in the treatment and taking care of myself and making sure I was doing the 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 homework and so I felt empowered and I and I'm you know and it, I'm willing to be the example of what not to do, you know, for, for someone to, to, for the light bulb to go off and someone to go, I better not make this same decision. And uh, yeah, thank you. But I'd like to ask you though, so when you saw Mickey that first time and he gave you some exercises to do, so you were a really good patient, you did them. Well, <laughs> you did, the second time. So that, let's this is be, the first time. I have to be honest, and we, I mean, I'm. It, this is the first time I'm hearing this. All this, it's not. <laughs> no, no, no. The, I mean, the first time in 2012 was two weeks. I mean, it was easy to, to take the advice and in, instructions and go home and do it. In, in 2016, the rehabilitation was six months, four months, you know, till I felt normal, six months till I felt like a race car driver. But, and so after two months of doing that stuff, you're kind of thinking, is this even working? Am I really going to get where I want to go? I'm tired of doing these. They're, re they're repetitive. And, and it's, and you just, if, if I, you know, if my wife wasn't there every day going, you're doing it, um, <laughs> you know, if she wasn't there, I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have done the work. I really have to be honest. I, I wouldn't have pushed myself as much as I needed to. So, you know, I, I uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's very important. I think I was talking to somebody tonight and they had had an injury and they were, they had read the book and they were thankful for the book, but so one of their loved ones had read the book as well. And I thought that that was really the person that, that it, the book, that needed the book the most. Because when I was, <laughs> when I was around my family, I was, it was so hard for me to help them understand what I was doing, what I was dealing with, why I felt the way I felt. And if I'd had a book to go, hey, read this, and man, it's really going to help you help me, and, and, and we'll get through this a whole lot easier if you have this information. But man, it's so tough. Because um, you can't really put into words yeah, what it you is that you're feeling. That was the hard, that was my worry about writing the book was could I help someone who'd never been through a concussion understand what a concussion is because it's so hard to articulate. It's really, really hard to describe 
because I, I couldn't think of any real life instances or, or experiences that I could compare my symptoms to and say, well, this feels like this. You've, 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 you've felt this before. This is what it feels like. I couldn't do that. I didn't have any experiences that were like this, these symptoms. I mean, I've never had ocular issues or balance issues and, uh, and some of the things that I was dealing with. But, um, what are be, some of the exercises he made you do? The exercises were so simple. And that was the, that was the struggle mm-hmm. is that you're thinking, man, is this really going to do something? Because he's like, do you like playing basketball? I'm like, yeah, sure. I've I got to go play some basketball. He's like, well, just uh, have somebody pass the ball, spin around, shoot a shot. I'm like, in my, you know, I didn't tell this to Mickey because I didn't want to insult him. But <laughs> I had to do more than that. I know, but <laughs> I'm, us- I'm using that one. I'll give you a chance. I'm yeah. using that one as an example. And I would, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this uh, for 10 minutes. It was, the, the entire exercise regimen was t- about two hours a day every single day. And, uh, and about 30 or 45 minutes of it was on the computer using these glasses that were trying to retrain my eyes to be tethered together to work well together. But anyhow, the, the, you know, the, the physical stuff was really simple, not, not challenging. Uh, don't have to be extremely coordinated to do these exercises. But they seem so simple, and the symptoms are so uh, troubling uh, and scary that you're thinking, how does this simple act fix this complex problem that I can't see? You know, it's, it, 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 you know, it just seemed, uh, you know, helpless at times. And so my wife would say, we're doing them. He said, we're doing them, we're doing them. And I'm like, all right, we're doing them. And then I would go to see Mickey every four weeks. and He would put me through those exercises. And those exercises, when I got them, triggered me to have problems. We'd go through those exercises at a four-week checkup, and they wouldn't trigger me anymore. And I'm thinking, oh, man, all right, that's great. That's progress. But now what am I going to do? I need to be triggered. I need my body's got to get this. You know, I need to trigger these symptoms to make my brain work to get well. And they give you more. They give you new exercises and new challenges. And, um, you know, it just, but they were very sort of simple and, and, and not very, you know, I mean. How did you come up with all of these various exercises? Good question. Um, <laughs> we, how did something so simple become so effective? The, the key to treating a vestibular problem is retraining it. When we put a fire, fighter pilot up in the air, we expose them to G-forces so they don't throw up in the cockpit. You have to train that system so it can tolerate those movements. And so by making Dale feel the symptoms, we knew how to treat the symptoms by creating certain movements. And sometimes it's more horizontal movements or sometimes it's more vertical movements. Sometimes it's being in a grocery store or a car ride. You know, he had his ocular system was weak, so we had to strengthen the, the eyes. But we've created exercises that actually retrain the systems that decompensate from the injury. And um, we have an incredible team. It's not just me. We have very uh, skilled physical therapists that we've worked on this for two decades. You know, So we've been doing it for a long time, and we've put together a very, I think, a pretty targeted approach at, at managing this. But everyone presents differently. And no one's the same, and you have to figure out where it's coming from to fix it. And that's why we would assess it in certain ways and then train it. So you've got somebody, let's say, who has memory issues. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have them be spinning around the basketball? N- nope. Um, the memory issues, believe it or not, with concussion mostly come from the sympathetic nervous system. And so there's a lot of anxiety that's involved with memory problems from concussion. When I hear memory problems, I think it's the nervous system that's causing it. And in fact, it usually is. And so we had to treat that with Dale as well. And, we, and the way you treat anxiety is by exposure. So I actually wanted Dale to do things that elicited that sympathetic nervous system involvement. And you did have some memory stuff early on, Dale, and when we retrained this, this stuff, because the vestibular system is connected to the nervous system, if you retrain the vestibular system, the anxiety gets better. But you have to attack it. You, you can't let it attack you, and that's the key. So anxiety plays a big role, and understandably, too. It does. It plays a very big role. And it, this happens more in very analytic people that don't express things well and hold a lot inside. And that nervous system, when it's running hot, it can really cause a lot of difficulties for folks to get through this. 
We had some questions from audience members, so I'm going to try to remember what some of them are. Mm -hmm. um, some memory issues, word retrieval. Somebody asked about Same word thing. retrieval, so that's anxiety, sympathetic. Did you that's, have that issue? Yeah, I mean, uh, try, you know, when you are, you're in the middle of a normal conversation and you get to a point in the sentence where the next word is not available. I don't know how, you know, it's just you're, you know it's a, it's a very simple word you've used every day. You've probably used it multiple times already that day, but it just isn't there anymore. It's, a, it's removed from the system. But it comes back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you, you have exercises that you put? Or if we treat, sometimes when you hear a symptom like that, you think it's an actual word retrieval problem, but it's actually coming from the nervous system. So if we treat that, the word retrieval comes back. OK, problems with focus, or if somebody used to be able to learn quickly, and suddenly they find that they can't quite get it as quickly as they used to. That's all on the same? I would think ocular with that, because focus is actually using your eyes to focus, and we see a lot of problems with that system. But also that foggy feeling, that feeling one step behind, detached, removed, disassociated feeling that you felt immediately after the accident in that restaurant, for example, that comes from the vestibular system when it's not working. That signal comes through aberrantly and it causes that fog to kind of spill over you. And so when I hear foggy, I think vestibular or I think nervous system as well. It can come from that as well. I'm curious, when he came back to you five years later, mm -hmm. After I, I have to not laugh, but sort of laugh, that he has come out with his issues, told the world about them, encouraging people to talk openly about their symptoms, and yet you kind of didn't for a while yeah. until you did. And, um, and now we're also grateful that you're not only telling the people about it, but you've got this book that you've written about it to help everybody. When you saw him five years later, yeah. did you see different things? And also, in those five years, you have learned more. Because in addition to seeing patients, your program does research. Right. So you learned more about We advanced patients. so much. And I, hopefully, Dale can shed light on that. But I think we really had advanced from 2012 to 2016, number one. But when I saw Dale the second time, race car driving didn't even, I was very worried about him. He had gone down a pathway that he was very sick. Uh, it was affecting his life, your life, significantly. Socially, physically, um, emotionally, there was a lot of things that you were going through that was really problematic. And, and honestly, I think I told you the first time I saw you in 2016, it's like, we got to get you back to feeling like a human being here. I don't even care about race car driving. That's a whole different conversation we got to have. He was much sicker in 2016. So did he still fit into those categories, the vestibular? He fit in more of them, oh, in more okay. severe levels of each of them. I'd say the primary profiles that he had, um, vestibular, ocular, and anxiety, were the three that I would tag you with, and I think you'd probably agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And we had to treat each of those in very specific ways. The, mm -hmm. When we went in 2012, the, the treatment was a lot more... Um, about rest and and less activity, and in just the period of time from 2012 to 2016, the the approach that he has to to treatment has changed dramatically, and it was about exposure and and whereas in 2012 he wanted to play less video games, if not at all, no phone, anything that would that wanted to exercise my mind. Um, such as any kind of uh, technology, was out. Couldn't do that. And uh, that was pretty frustrating uh, because my wife was a stickler for all the rules. But, <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. And so um, in 2016, it was, it was um, full on, like wide open, go do, be. I, I would call him and say, man, I, in a, I'm in this grocery store and I'm struggling and all the symptoms are firing up real big. And he's like, step out, cool off, go back in. Keep, char keep challenging your mind. He's, you, know, you don't overdo it, but you, you go in there and you trigger those symptoms. And then you calm down a little bit and get somewhere comfortable. And then you go back again and keep, keep going there like stretching a muscle. And over time, it goes away. You know, your mind 
your mind, it's really the anxiety that's creating those problems, is the nervousness. You go in there and you feel something and you worry if other people can see it, and, and then it starts to double in, in, in intensity. And uh, I've, he's like, you know, go to concerts and, and go to environments that are wild and complex, and, 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 uh, which was fun. You know, we went to concerts and we had fun. And uh, all this time I'm outside the car and uh, my, co- my, my family and, and my team are like, why are you going to concerts? Oh, why aren't you back in the car racing? Pharma treatment. Huh, what's going on? <laughs> so, you know, that's the challenge. And, and it, it's, it's the same for anybody else in, in other professions. It's, you know, you, people, it's hard for people to see, you know, what you're feeling and what, what's going on inside you. And, but I took his advice, and we, we tried to get into complex environments. And, and because I wouldn't have otherwise, I would have avoided those things. I felt great. I felt 100% sitting on my couch. <laughs> and I would have stayed there every day because that's where I felt the best. I wouldn't have wanted to go to the grocery store because it, it, it wasn't fun. You had to push yourself. Yeah. Did you ever try anything like yoga? I know there's a, there's a yoga class that's going to be starting here locally, and it, it is for people who've had mild traumatic brain injuries. You never putting... prescribed yoga. Well, you very should think internal, about it. It's a very internal exercise, and you don't, move the, you don't move enough to fix the vestibular problem by yoga. You've got to fix that problem by movement and retraining. In yoga, you're not moving fast enough you to You might kind help of with the anxiety. Correct. Yeah. But you also might get a little more internal doing yoga, too, because that can lead that direction as well. But I have nothing against people who do yoga. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to know. Um, do you give all your patients your phone number? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Because I was going to just not. hand it out to um, everybody. But I did give Dale mine, and, um, yeah, I wanted to make sure he felt comfortable in reaching out, and you did reach out yeah. on several occasions, and I'm glad he did. In your book, you said you were worried that um, you would reach out too often. Yeah, yeah. I, um, you know, he's a doctor, and he's in Pittsburgh, and he's busy taking care of other people, and he's got his family uh, to be with after work. And I'm a firm believer in that. When, when somebody's in, during work hours, it's time to ask work questions. When, when it's 5 o'clock or on the weekend, uh, you don't bother people. I don't bother my employees and uh, bother, you know, while they're trying to enjoy an all, a weekend off. So uh, I felt very awkward calling him in, in the middle of the night or, or on a weekend about a, an, an emotional issue, something, something that was something that as a man, or, you know, you, we feel like, man, we should be in control of. And... Uh, and so that was difficult, but and there was a couple times with my eyes. So I have uh, I've got these animals out in this out in this field out back behind the house, and I got this window, and I can see them out there. And and I was doing a lot of walk exercises that involved walking. And any time I took a step, the whole world shook uh, when my eyes sort of become untethered. Uh, and so if I took a step, just that that violent the violence of just taking a step would just shake the whole world. And I would, every morning I'd walk across the floor in the living room looking out the window at them animals, and they would shake. And I would sort of self-analyze whether they were shaking more than yesterday or less. Yeah. And They're buffalo by I was going to ask, I going to have them. I was <laughs> buffalo. I didn't want to say that. So the ground might <laughs> shake, the ground might shake when they were walking yeah. by. But this is real. So this is three months, and it's the same. For three months, every day, it's the same shake. And I called him, and I said, Mickey, this seems like this is not working. This isn't getting better. I'm, I cannot live this way. And, uh, and he said, you know, he, he tried to calm me down. And I said, just have, tell me you fixed this in some people. And he goes, I fixed it. And a lot? And he goes, yeah, I fixed it a lot. And I'm like, all right, I guess that's all I need to know. Is it, you, you have fixed it? Because, I mean... That's a, that's a hard the, conversation to have the, with well, someone. The, but. I think what, my, what I'm trying to say is that as a patient... I don't feel right. Well, as a patient, you go to the doctor, and, and, and we all 
the doctor is supposed to tell us things are going to work out. Things are going to be fine. You're going to get over this cold or whatever it is. Uh, and this is a much more serious, there's a real consequences here uh, with, this, with this injury. And I had to dig into you to, decide, to hear whether you were telling me what I wanted to hear mm-hmm. or what was really true. And, and so I'm glad I had that number. I know not all your patients do, but um, it was really reassuring to be able to reach out and say, you know, almost grab you by the collar and go, hey, ha, ha, are you telling me this is really going to get fixed or not? You know, do you re- have you really fixed this before? And I was going to ask you that question. It was yeah. a question from somebody in the audience. Yeah. Do you really heal people's concussions? Can we, you really do that? Well, I, we can get them to feel normal, yes. And that, the, what causes a concussion is an energy crisis at the cellular level. That corrects itself very quickly. These systems decompensate, and you have to retrain the systems to get them to feel normal. And yeah, the brain's functioning normally when you recovered. Now, there's a lot of research we have to do, Diane, in looking at these potential long-term effects, and, but the, jury, it, the jury's out on that. There's not good science yet to fully understand those issues. There's a lot we don't know. And that makes people uncomfortable, but it's the reality of it. But that research is going to take time. It's going to be done, and we're going to learn more about it. But you know, getting back to your question, Dale, I mean, that conversation, that's really hard for me as well because what I'm hearing is, oh, I don't feel confident right now about where I'm at. And boy, that's frustrating as a, as, a, as a clinician because I knew we could get you better from this. I was 100% sure, but how to articulate that to you so you understood that? Just like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all you can do is say that I've fixed it before, mm-hmm. which you said that, and you said I don't have any doubt. And I just needed to call you and hear that, mm-hmm. you know. But I was calling him at 9 o'clock at night on a Saturday. <laughs> so I felt very bad about that. No. And Lynn, my wife sitting here, um, we get those phone calls pretty, not uncommonly, you know, from, from people. And, and uh, you know, I talk about it, you know. And it's just, it's a hard call to get because I knew you were feeling pretty, pretty down. Um, How are you feeling now? You know, um, I, you know, we... I told Doc, I told Mickey when, when I was getting well, he said earlier that racing wasn't on the table. It wasn't a thought. You know, we were just going to work on me and not worry about what I, what I was. And when I went in there, I guess it was around November, we'd been working on this a couple months. I went in and I said, look, I said, there's two things that I need. I need to go hunting and climbing a deer stand, which is about 20 feet off the ground and not feel anything, which is, I didn't think was a realistic goal. Um, because when you, you know, when you have the balance and vestibular issues, that, you know, standing in a deer stand is the worst place to be. Um, and I wanted to get, I wanted to, I was getting married on New Year's and I said, I want to have such a clear mind on my wedding night that I don't even think about this. I don't want this to even be a, in the back of my mind, you know, I want to just enjoy and take in and absorb the memories that I'm going to make that night. And I went, I went deer hunting and, and uh, enjoyed that. And I sent a picture of he him. I was sitting in this tree and I took a picture and sent it to him. I said, look where I'm at. <laughs> I was so pumped. Yeah, he, he was, he was yeah. so happy. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, my wedding night was amazing. And, it, and I was completely 100% there in the moment when that was going on that night. I went and raced an entire season the next year and uh, crashed and had no problems. And uh, luckily I didn't have any very bad accidents to have to worry about, but I went through the rigors of a season without any setbacks and retired and went into broadcasting and have enjoyed the year and a half that I've been doing that. And I was telling him, uh, when we was talking to a reporter before he walked in here and I, you know, when I, when I was in concussion uh, land and thinking about concussions from 2012 to 2017, pretty much, I worried about long-term effects a lot. You know, I worried about the symptoms that I had, if they were permanent, and would they come back for no reason. You know, I, I worried about this all the time, as I think a lot of head injury, 
you know, concussion patients do. And today, I worry about natural illnesses and just what everybody else worries about. I don't think about concussions at all, and um, which is great, you know, because when you have that injury, and even when you're just recently well from it, you self-analyze every minute of the day. If you forget your keys or somebody's name or something so simple that everybody forgets, you think, is that part of my injury? Is that something that's still there? Or is this, you know, you want to connect everything or any kind of mental lapse or mistake to the concussion or to an injury or to your past. And I'll say to the people that maybe are doing that today, that the further away that you are removed from that incident and, and being well, that eventually just fades away and it's replaced by the normal concerns and worries of life. And uh, so today, uh, I feel as good as ever, you know, and I still race. I ran a race uh, within the last month. I like to scratch the itch. Uh, <laughs> so we had a lot what was, of, it, what was it like for you? I was thrilled. And I'll say this. You finished uh, well. Yeah, we finished in fifth place, so it was good. But I, I will say this, like if you're going to, if I'm, you know, if I'm going to have any sort of symptom or ever going to notice uh, any kind of, you know, limitation, it would be in those moments, driving that car or leading up to driving that car, getting ready to climb in when anxiety and nerves are through the roof, your heart's pounding, and... Um, and, you know, I, I went through that entire weekend with not even thinking about my head injury or my past or my history. And uh, I, don't, I don't even, you know, I don't know how to, how to tell you how nice that is. <laughs> but, Until we bring you here and you have to talk no, about no, it. No, 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 that's what... <laughs> the thing about, like, coming here is, um, you know, getting further and further removed from it, uh, still being effective in sharing the message. I wonder I think, what do you hope people will, yeah. when they leave here, what do you want them to take away from what you both have to say? You know, I, um, I, love, to, I love to help people that have uh, symptoms feel some relief. I, I can't help you clear up your symptoms like Mickey can. That's the guy that can fix the symptoms. But I can reassure you that it can, it can and will get better. That's powerful because I remember when I was sick, how worried I was and how nice it was to hear from someone who had been through that experience. You only wanted to talk to, not only, I wanted to talk to Mickey, of course, but I also wanted to talk to people who had been through what I was going through. That was so nice to hear their stories of how they've gotten well and how I was going to experience uh, the same thing. So that was great. Uh, but there's also, uh, I think, even more importantly than that, I know if those people are here tonight and they're getting treatment that they're going to be fine. Uh, the people that I think I'm more worried about is, is uh, people who haven't experienced concussions or know, but know someone who is. Uh, maybe, you'll, maybe you don't know someone today, but you will in your lifetime. Maybe it's a, a, a sister or a brother, your, your, your mom, your dad, your, your daughter, your son. Uh, and if you read the book or, or, or learn something from tonight, it may prepare you for that experience so that, that you can help that individual through theirs because uh, I, was, I, you know, I was very lucky to have my wife pushing me. I was lucky to have support around me all the time, but not everybody is. Not everybody is in a position to have someone with them every day pushing them through this system you know, and getting well. And so, uh, you know, I think that that book and, and our message can help a lot of those people. And, and concussions are more prevalent today. People take them more seriously, and so we hear a lot more about them. And people, are, people you know, if you asked me uh, 20 years ago how many people I knew that had concussions or had dealt with one, I couldn't probably tell you on one hand. Today, I can tell you... Dozens of people that I know have had dealt with it because it's so much more prevalent. We are more knowledgeable. We're, we're more apt to take treatment, accept treatment. We're more apt to encourage people. And so there's going to be more people 
uh, that that are going to have to help someone through this experience. And those people are as important as Mickey sitting here today, the doctor that can cure the cure the problems. Do you still do any of the exercises that he gave you to do back in 2016? I still have all the notes. I <laughs> what, his notes or your notes on the phone? I still have the sheets that I would take home with the, it's like this little figure, you know, pencil uh, figured person on there doing the exercises and I, I yeah. So you I mean, look at them, you don't do yeah, them, I have you don't the, have to. I have the glasses and everything from having to do the computer exercises and so forth. And Is there one exercise, somebody asked this, that you hated more than any? The eye exercises with the computer were tough. Um, and if I can explain this, it's tough to articulate and to, to help you understand. But these glasses were 3D glasses, and you would wear them and look at the screen, and these objects would go from, they would go from 3D to 1D. And if you're wearing 3D glasses and then that process is happening, it's try, it feels like it's trying to pull your eyes apart. And it's physically painful. Uh, and, and so those objects are moving like this really slow. And it, it, it's sore. It makes your eyes, it's like a, if your eyes are tethered together, if you can imagine them being tethered together, it's like stretching that tether like a rubber band. And it strength, strength, strengthens the ability for like when you look left and right for the both, both eyes to do, the ex do exactly what they need to do when you're looking around in a room. And mine wouldn't do that. You know, I would look left and, and it would make me sick or, or spin and, and it would get blurry because both eyes weren't going to the same place. And, uh, and also with the bouncing and everything else when I would walk or ride in a car. But those computer exercises were tough. The other stuff was easy to do, uh, just very tedious. Uh, the computer exercises I did not look forward to. But they, I knew, like, if anything's working, this is working because it hurts. Mm. So. <laughs> well, what a measure, huh? Yeah. What would you like people to walk away with for understanding and knowledge? Advances have been made. Um, we know a lot more about this injury than we ever have. Still a lot to learn. Uh, research is critical to getting to those questions about the long-term problems, but I can tell you in the short term, we're very good at treating this injury, and we understand how to get the patients better. And there's a lot of people, there's 1.8 to 3.6 million concussions per year in sports and recreation alone in this country. It's a very common injury, but there's treatments out there, and it's been, um, and I, I, I want kids to play sports. Sports are a wonderful thing, and we can't live in fear of this thing, especially when the advances that we're making are so robust. But um, I also want people to know how selfless Dale is coming up here and sharing his story. And he really did it because he wants other people to understand and learn. It's just a pretty cool thing. And I can't thank him enough for coming up here to Maine. And he's never been to Maine before, yeah. first day. Uh, so, pretty cool. I have to tell, you know, when he says that, um, you know, it's easy for me to come up here because Mickey gave me my life back twice, and when somebody does that for you, you do whatever they need anytime they need it for the rest of your life. And his message is so important anyways. It's powerful and it's real, and um, I, you know, I'm so thankful that I was able to get well and able to be push, positioned in front of him to be able to do that. And I know not, like... My fear is that somebody doesn't even know where to go to get help. Um, there's somebody, there's lots of people out there that don't even know that they can get help, that, they, that there is something that'll fix it. Because I know at one point in my life that I didn't know that. I didn't know to go to a doctor. And so I want to help steer people toward this guy. I want him to, uh, to be able to help as many people as possible and... Um, so it's a, it's a lot of fun. I'm so thankful. And also, you know, he, we're great friends, and I like to hang out with the guy, too. So. <laughs> I, I heard a rumor he's getting lobster when he leaves here. <laughs> Not everybody has access to you, right. unfortunately. Um, so somebody did ask, are there going to be other centers like yours that are going to be springing up? There are great centers all over the country that are coming forth. And, and 
medicine takes a long time to change, and there's a lot of research that needs to happen, and how you disseminate that to other practitioners is really critical, but we publish, we do lectures, and there are great clinics popping up. Maine is one of the most advanced states for concussion management, with some of the work being done at Colby and, and other places here. There's great work being done here, and there's great practitioners here in the state. Um, and so you don't, I mean, there are really good clinicians out there, but you that's do want to make sure you go to the right specialist. That's for this. right, that's, mm -hmm. that's key. And even to be with somebody after you've been healed, because you need that support even afterwards, like you were talking about. Our time is up. I want to thank you both for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and for getting so personal with us. I know, I know that you've saved some people. I just know here in the room, you've helped people, and it's going to be beyond this room. And now, we have two people lurking over here <laughs> because there's going to be a book signing. And so, please join me first in welcoming or uh, thanking these tremendous people for the work they did today. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. We have some, some husky swag for our people today. Thank you. Now, just a, a reminder, thank you everybody who participated tonight and came tonight. Uh, your money goes to what we call our Promise Scholarships, and they help to open the door of education for some extremely deserving students. So everybody who made a donation, we ask you to keep on making donations uh, in the name of our students who are tremendous. I'm going to have uh, President of the USM Foundation, Ainsley Wallace, talk to you a little bit about some logistics of the book signing process that will go on for the next half hour or so. So I'm going to turn it over to Ainsley. Wallace, but once again, thank you on behalf of USM for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, President Cummings, and thanks again, Dale and Mickey, Diane, and what a special conversation this has been tonight, and for 125 of you, the night's not over yet. Um, many of you who came to uh, the VIP reception Earlier, you already have signed copies of, uh, of the book by Dale and Mickey, uh, but for 125 of you, you signed up to be part of the book registration. And so I just want to quickly give you the logistics of how that's going to work, um, because uh, Dale and Mickey are being so generous to give, uh, to give a little bit of their time to sign a bunch of books before having a hard stop and needing to get out of here. So if you have a ticket, what you're going to do when we, when we conclude is that you're going to start a line down here and my team over here, Pam, Vicki, and Anne, will help you. You'll give your ticket to, uh, to one of them. They'll escort you up the stairs where we're gonna have a quick, quick set change here, and, um, which Rodney and Nick are making possible right now. Uh, the book signing's gonna happen right up here, and then you will be whisked away off the other side of the stairs and out uh, to enjoy the rest of your evening. So, um, so for those of you who have tickets for the book signing, please feel free to come and line up over here. To the rest of you, thank you again for joining us and have a great night.